We are going to be looking at the mysterious deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. This is an older case that doesn't have too much coverage, I would say. So today's case takes place in Bryan, Arkansas, in a suburb of Little Rock. And we're going to be talking about Larry Kevin Ives and Donald George Henry, who are best friends and very popular. And Larry also went by, or most of the time went by Kevin. So we will be referring to him as Kevin. They were about to start their senior year of high school. So this is a very exciting time in your life. And this case takes place in the 80s. So of course, they liked working on their muscle cars in their spare time. They also enjoyed hunting and going out with friends and on double dates with their girlfriends. So Don was known as the funny one in the friendship. He was always cracking jokes, trying to make Kevin laugh. There's not that much information on them out there. Just so you guys know, that's pretty this case, much it. Really. Yeah. I mean, there's mm -hmm. really not a whole lot. So, so we're going to be starting pretty much with Saturday night, August 22nd, 1987. And they had met a group of friends outside of Little Rock at a parking lot where they all like to hang out. They left the group around midnight and and drove to Don's house for their curfew. They planned to spend the night there. So Don had to ask his dad, Curtis, if he could go. So Kevin waited on the porch while Don went in to talk to his dad. Curtis was in the bedroom when Don came in and he asked if he could go hunting in the woods near their house. They talked about it for 15 minutes and Curtis told them that they could go, but to be careful. So they normally hunted along the railroad tracks near Don's house, and they got to their usual spot shortly before 1 a.m. And they were out there for hours. It's never a really good idea to go rolling down the railroad tracks. You never know mm -hmm. when a train might be coming. That's exactly what happened. Around 4.25 a.m., a 6,000 ton cargo train going over 50 miles an hour was on its usual night run through Saline County to Little Rock. But the train that actually ran through the town that night had 75 cars and was over a mile long. The engineer of this train at the time was Stephen Schroyer, and there was also three other workers on the train that could see the tracks up ahead. The farther and farther they kept traveling, Stephen noticed something was on the tracks, and he was absolutely shocked to realize what it was. As they got close enough, he realized that he saw bodies laying across the railroad tracks like corpses in a morgue, and their lower bodies were covered by a light green tarp, according to him. And all four men on the train who had the view of the boys also saw this particular tarp. But Stephen immediately attempted to do an emergency stop and blew the diesel horn multiple times uh, to alert, I mean, if mm -hmm. they happened to be alive, which it didn't look like they were, to get out of the way, you know. How scary would that yeah. be? Seriously. He estimated that there were about three to five seconds to impact in the way the train carried mm. it for a full half mile. It literally takes half a mile for it to even stop. But unfortunately, the bodies never moved. There is no reaction from it. There is not even a flinch of activity coming from them at all. And sadly, the train ran right over them. And sadly, the two bodies that were on the train tracks were none other than 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives, who passed away on August 23rd, 1987. And this case has kind of been named the boys on the tracks like if you mm -hmm. look it up that's kind of what it's under and that's because these two boys literally died on the railroad tracks don's 22 caliber rifle was lying parallel next to them and the spotlight they used to hunt was also nearby the men on the train obviously had experience hitting animals and all of them happened to be hunters as well and if the boys had been killed by the train there should have been bright red blood splattered everywhere but the blood that they saw was thick and purplish in color which indicated that it mm -hmm. seemed like the boys had actually been dead for some time prior to being hit by the train. And that obviously lines up well with Stephen's explanation that they were just laying there and they're honking the horn and they didn't move. Clearly, visibly, they weren't alive. Right, visibly, they were already deceased. Saline County Sheriff's deputies responded to the scene and were there within minutes. And the witnesses told the officers what had happened, including their observation of the blood, the fact that they had seen a green tarp over the boys. So despite the officers who arrived on the scene getting all this information from the witnesses about the blood, the tarp and all of that, the officers did not even that didn't like register with them because they treated the scene like an accident They didn't even or suicide. They didn't look at it as a possible murder at all. Mm -mm. I mean, which is kind of wild to think about. You would think that a police officer would at least have enough knowledge about, you know, blood mm -hmm. and decomposition that they would know that maybe there's a chance that this right? could be murder but evidence wasn't collected and the next train was allowed to just come right through right so there goes all your evidence all your po possible dna i mean that's going to be all contaminated and completely gone that is unbelievable how did that even happen i don't understand but the paramedics that arrived on the scene did not believe that it was an accident they added a note in the file that they believe that the boys were dead before they were hit and that is so so crucial and then the next morning don's dad curtis discovered the boys weren't home 
He immediately freaked out and he called Linda Ives, who's Kevin's mom, and he was checking to see if they were there, but they weren't. News of what happened spread quickly through this town. Very small town, of course, and these boys were popular, so everyone found out about this really fast and were very upset. Don's dad heard from a neighbor that there were two teenage boys who had been shot, killed, and tied to the railroad tracks, but he, of course, didn't know who they were, but the fact that his kids were missing, I mean, his son and his friend. So the police arrived to his house shortly after, and Curtis was able to confirm that the two boys who were killed were Don and Kevin. Obviously, after an extremely traumatic event like this, where, you know, bodies are are mangled, they're taken to the coroner's office where they're examined by the medical examiner. And that's exactly what happened with Don and Kevin. So Dr. Fami Malik was the Arkansas state medical examiner at the time, and he ended up ruling the deaths an accident. And he had said that the boys had smoked the equivalent of 20. And that's possibly why they were on the train tracks. Yeah, claim that they were intoxicated due to it it just the science doesn't work. It, It doesn't make any sense at all. And even their friends that they were hanging out earlier that night said that they might have had a on them, but not much more than that. Like they weren't, it wasn't like they were rolling around pounds of they planned to like, or a bunch of concentrate that they were going to like do but that night, you know, it wasn't mm-hmm. like that was in the plans to do in the first place. They were going to go hunting like they always did. So their parents were like so confused by this medical examiner's ruling on, on their, their case. Plus, according to Kevin's father, Larry Ives, he was always home when Kevin had got home from school and he never showed any signs of using or anything like that and his mother linda was home every night as well and she said the same thing linda also didn't understand how the boys ended up in identical positions lying perfectly parallel on the tracks so the families did not believe that the boys would just be taking a nap from smoking some when a loud noise was like that plus don's dad was very skeptical about where his son's rifle was found as it was lying next to the boys in the gravel and he knew don would never risk scratching the wood of his prize rifle this was like a big deal for him so the families were absolutely convinced that don henry and kevin ives had been murdered prior to the train running over them one thing that's really weird to note is that a week before the murders there was a suspicious man in a military fatigue outfit seen walking along the train tracks. A Bryant Patrol police officer, Danny Allen, actually stopped the man to question him, and the man immediately pulled out his gun and started shooting at him. Isn't that crazy? And yeah. Danny ducked, and by the time he stood up, the man was just gone. So the Saline County Sheriff's Office responded within five minutes and searched the area. He was never found. And this man was spotted again the same night that the boys were killed. He was wearing the same military fatigues, He was walking away from the town along the tracks about 200 yards from where the bodies were hit. But no one knows who this man was or what he was doing that night either. The families questioned a lot of the moves made by the police during the investigation as well. And people in the town started to talk a lot, you know, trying to figure out what had happened. Everyone was trying to kind of solve the case themselves. And eventually people started going to the crime scene, of course. But days after the boys were killed, a relative found a shoe that still had a foot in it at the crime scene. So the police officers at the scene also claimed that the green tarp never existed. They said that the men on the train spotted an optical illusion that made it look like the boys were covered in a tarp, their lower bodies, but it actually was never there. So Larry and Linda Ives luckily were able to afford to hire a private investigator to help them try to make sense of this homicide. But the police kept throwing up roadblocks. Whenever the PI tried to get information or question officers, no one would cooperate with him. Dr. Malik said it was an accidental death, which was the only explanation the police seemed willing to consider. So in February of 1988, all the parents got together and held a joint press conference. They wanted to put pressure on the police to reopen the case So they decided to use the media. And luckily for the families, Dr. James Garrett of San Antonio was actually recruited to give a second opinion on the medical examiner's report. And at the press conference, Dr. Garrett said that any amount of would not cause the boys to lose consciousness, slip into a coma, or even fall into a deep sleep, as Dr. Malik had claimed. He also explained that the only reliable test to find in a person's system was called mass spectrometry. And this was a test that hadn't been done on either boy. A toxicologist from North Carolina, Dr. Arthur McBray, also called Dr. Malik's findings very bizarre. And he confirmed that no amount of tea would have caused Don and Kevin to lose consciousness on the railroad tracks. And luckily for them, the press conference worked. And the very next day, the investigation was officially reopened. And there was a new prosecutor, Prosecutor Richard Garrett. 
and he actually ordered that Kevin and Don's body be exhumed for a second autopsy. Not only that, they had well-respected Georgia medical examiner Dr. Joseph Burton perform this second autopsy, and he determined the boys had smoked one or two, maybe, based on you know the levels of, and nowhere near the 20 that you know, Dr. Malik had said prior. Dr. Burton also found evidence that one of the boys was dead when he was run over by the train and the other was unconscious at that time. In July of 1988, a grand jury led by Dan Harmon heard the evidence and actually ruled on the case. Dan was actually friends with prosecutor Richard Garrett and he had talked to both families acting as an advocate and volunteering to help them in any way that he could. So with the case reopened, Richard started interviewing all the witnesses again. When he talked to the four men on the train, they all told him about that light green tarp covering the boys. But the police officers who searched the scene not only didn't find the tarp, apparently, but they also claimed that none of the men on the train had ever mentioned it to them. Neither of the boys or their families ever owned a light green tarp, so they were really confused. Six weeks after the case was reopened, Richard discovered a case just like the one that he was investigating. And it took place in 1984 in Hodgin, Oklahoma, just 200 miles west of Little Rock. Two young men were killed in a very similar way on the railroad tracks. Their names were Billy Hainline and Dennis Decker, and they were lying on the tracks in almost identical positions to Kevin and Don. They were hit by an oncoming train, but no suspects were ever identified. He also had another autopsy done on the boys, and there was a shocking discovery. Don's shirt and body showed evidence of stab wounds. He had been stabbed in the back with a sharp object. And like, this medical examiner said that these injuries were inflicted before they were hit by the train. In 1988, the grand jury ruled the cause of death of Don and Kevin as a probable homicide, reversing Dr. Malik's findings, which was huge for their family. And despite all of this, Dr. Malik withheld crucial documents and insisted that his report was accurate and that the boys were not murdered. Later, it was discovered that Dr. Malik had botched multiple cases in his career as a medical examiner, and he was also involved in multiple mm -hmm. cover-ups. One of the theories that's out there revolving around the boys' deaths is that perhaps mm -hmm. either they were involved with some type of deal or perhaps they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and there was some sort of drop that happened near the railroad tracks mm -hmm. while they happened to be there, and they witnessed it, and therefore they were murdered. And I think that would make the most sense. I mean, personally, that's what I think happened here. Plus, Bright, Arkansas was known as a trafficking hub. A confidential informant has actually confirmed this theory to be true that, in fact, there was a field near the tracks where the mm -hmm. boys were killed that was an actual drop site. And the reason we know this is because this was actually in a police report that was filed seven months after the murders. But it's also interesting to me that there is that similar case uh, in Hodgin mm -hmm. that two boys ended up dead on the tracks as well. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if that was a drop site as well for, Maybe. but I mean, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what are the chances? What are the chances? Yeah. Two groups like come across a situation. Right. I don't right. know. Even though this case was reopened and theories were presented, there just wasn't enough evidence to really pursue anything seriously. So this case went went cold pretty quickly. But a few years later, after the murders, uh, witnesses started kind of coming out of the woodworks. And one of those witnesses was Tommy Nyehouse. And he was actually a 12-year-old boy who claimed to witness the murders. But he didn't come forward until he was 18 years old. So six years. Yeah, Almost quite a time. After. Quite a while afterwards. Yeah. And he actually came forward and said that he was with a group of friends in the woods that night and he said he saw a group of men on the tracks. He said Don and Kevin were nearby and turned around when they saw the men. But one of the men called them over. And when the boys hesitated, a shot was fired and they ran. He said the men chased after them. And Tommy actually knew one of the men. It was his mother's boyfriend, Dan Harmon. The man who led the grand jury for the case and asked to be appointed special prosecutor. After giving this statement, Tommy actually went on to pass polygraph tests and was deemed a credible witness. So much so that they put him into witness protection. And a witness named Ronnie Goodwin came forward and he said that he saw the boys matching Don and Kevin's descriptions in the parking lot and they were being harassed by two police officers. The officers started beating the boys and hit one of them in the face with a butt of a rifle, which makes a lot of sense. They then threw the boys into a truck. It wasn't marked, but Ronnie knew it was a police vehicle. Two more witnesses confirming this story were later called as witnesses in another grand jury hearing, but both of them were murdered before they could even testify. Keith McCaskill, that local 
dealer and police informant was also on the tracks that night. He was called to testify before the grand jury and he had said that he was afraid for his life because he knew something about the railroad track thing. He had given information about the case to Richard Garrett and he knew he'd be killed for it. Keith told his friends and family goodbye and planned his own funeral. Keith was murdered on November 10th, 1988, and he was... 113 times by Ronald Shane Smith. A fellow inmate claimed that Ronald had been paid $4,000 to kill Keith. He was found guilty in August of 1989 and sentenced to 10 years in prison. So the new grand jury ended up ruling the cause of death for Don and Kevin to be a definite homicide. So the investigation into the deaths of Don and Kevin were officially closed in 1995. Prosecutor Richard Garrett stayed committed to discovering the truth of the murders until he died. On October 23rd, 2018, he was 72 years old, but he truly cared about the case and he wanted answers for the family so bad. Kevin and Don's families believe that the boys were murdered, of course, and they're not giving up, but they're still not getting the answers that they want or cooperation from the police to this day. In 2016, Linda Ives filed a suit against the CIA, the FBI, and the Bryant Police Department for violating the Federal Freedom of Information Act, and a federal judge ended up dismissing the case. And still to this day, no suspects were ever charged for the murders of Don and Kevin, sadly. And that's it. That's all the information there is. They need like a full scale investigation of this police department. And, they do. And all the sheriff's deputies and everybody involved at the time. But yeah. again, so much time has passed since this has happened that most of these people are dead. Mm -hmm. So there's not, I mean, unfortunately, I, I don't know that this family or both of their families will ever get the justice they they deserve but that's it for this episode of the mile Heart podcast hopefully you thought it was interesting and intriguing as much as we did stay safe and stay woke <laughs>